This video is sponsored by Longevity Technology. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video you will gain an understanding of aging clocks, what they are and why they are being investigated, the different types of clocks being studied and which are commercially available, as well as addressing some challenges the clocks currently face and whether any of the clocks are hands down the best. Get it? So for now this will be a very generic overview. I may do more specialised videos at a later date, but at least you will have this as a go-to reference point. So before we look at some ageing clocks, there are two key terms that you need to understand. The first one is super easy, and that's chronological age, or CA as I may refer to from now on. And this is your age since birth. The second one is a bit more challenging to interpret, and that is biological age. Unlike chronological age, Biological age is a so-called latent variable, that is, it can only be inferred, as we'll see below. But the idea is that it provides a better prediction of your health status than chronological age. So, biological age can be thought of as a composite measurement that correlates with various health outcomes, but for these reasons could have more relevance for disease prediction, diagnostics and treatment outcomes than just knowing how old someone is. And so, naturally, chronological age and biological age will correlate. And so, therefore, chronological age can be used to evaluate how good these different ageing clocks are. So, what exactly is an ageing clock then? Well, a simple explanation is some sort of panel of different markers, which we'll look at later, that can be used to predict chronological age when modelled. And so you might think then, well, what's the point of understanding biological age? Well, effectively, here using ageing clocks, you're predicting chronological age from biological ageing biomarkers. So to give an example, one hopeful use of these different ageing clocks is to be able to test the efficacy of different anti-ageing interventions. And so you can then test the intervention and measure some biomarkers to predict the age that the clock gives you, and then compare that to the actual chronological age. And so the inferred chronological age from these ageing clocks is effectively the biological age. Now I still don't feel like I fully conveyed the idea correctly yet, so let's have a look at some features of ageing clocks that are desirable, and the first one being the idea that it's modifiable. It's something that can be intervened and altered. So my chronological age will always increase each year that I'm on planet Earth, like there's nothing I can really do about it. But I could modify my biological age or my inferred chronological age from these different aging clocks depending on my lifestyle or different interventions that are taken. So someone might be 50 years old but have an inferred chronological age of these clocks which you can think of as biological age as much older so 55 or younger such as like 45. But the funny thing with this feature is the fact it kind of has a catch-22 issue going on because you want an aging clock that changes with interventions to evaluate how these interventions are working. But at the same time, if you want to validate the clock itself, you need to have validated anti-aging interventions that you know are going to work to validate the biomarkers. But anyway, we'll take a look at some of the challenges at the end of the video. But some other features of clocks that are going to be desirable are going to be high prediction, high accuracy. Is the clock actually giving us the right information? The third feature is that you want it to be highly precise and reproducible. So if you did the sample twice, would you get the same answer? Because biology can be noisy and the sensitivity of the marker being measured could maybe overinterpret or misvalues. And so there could be technical variability as well as biological variability. Another important feature is cost. As this would definitely affect how scalable the different clocks are, as well as how affordable they are for people. And then lastly, a very important feature is that it's non-invasive and can be easily measured. So things like saliva samples, cheek swabs, hair samples, and I guess to some extent blood samples. And so again, these are just desirable features. It may be more informative to have tissue samples, but I don't think there's going to be much demand in an aging clock that requires more uh, invasive tissue samples. So aging clocks have the potential to help evaluate different anti-aging interventions, but they could also be useful to get a biological age of someone, so an inferred chronological age, which could therefore be used to predict the risk of different diseases. 
sort of an early prediction. And the clocks themselves may also elucidate on the actual underpinning ageing mechanism, which could highlight further areas of interest and future study. And it could be that different ageing clocks reflect different components of the ageing process, and that understanding them in total could help us to build a better paradigm of ageing. So this now nicely brings us on to the different types of clocks that have been published. So a common feature across these different clocks is that they use different metrics, so different biomarkers, and mathematical models. Typically, linear regression models are used, but within the last few years, more frequently, artificial intelligence has been used to gather this information and predict a value for biological age. And so I don't want to go into too much mathematical detail here, but a linear regression is just trying to identify a relationship between variables. So here the the biomarkers that are being measured and biological age. So before I go through the clocks, I do want to apologise to any authors who may be watching whose work I don't mention or mention only in passing because this area is pretty extensive and I really just wanted to provide a beginner's guide in this first video. So one category of human ageing clocks that you've possibly heard about are epigenetic ageing clocks, otherwise known as DNA methylation clocks since they're based on DNA methylation marks. And in particular, they're based on methylation of cytosine residues found in CPG sites of DNA. Now you don't really need to understand what CPG sites are or methylation is to understand what these clocks do, but effectively they look for the presence or absence of methyl groups at different sites in the genome. And they can do this from DNA samples. And many different epigenetic clocks have been made some of which are highlighted in this timeline you can see here, albeit it's now a little bit outdated. But all of the clocks quantitatively combine different DNA methylation levels at lots of different sites into a composite methylation-based age predictor. And these have shown very high correlations with chronological age. And in addition to being able to predict chronological age, they've also been shown to have other values, such as being able to predict all-cause mortality as well as morbidity and mortality risk, when other clinical ageing measures are also taken into account. So these epigenetic ageing clocks have the ability to measure biological age and can also correlate with various health outcomes. Moreover, epigenetic clocks have also been used as evidence to show reversal of age. This has been seen at least twice already, firstly in the TRIME study that showed that the DNA methylation age was reversed when patients were given a combination of human growth hormone, DHEA, and metformin. And the other case in which DNA methylation was used was when evaluating the cellular reprogramming of retinal cells treated with the Yamanaka factors, described in this Nature publication from the Sinclair lab last year. And so in addition to DNA methylation, clocks have also now been made using microRNAs, so small RNAs found within a cell, and looking at different expression patterns, as well as using the human microbiome. Moreover, clocks have been made that have used the expression of different genes in different tissues, and so this is known as transcriptomic data. But another area where there's now been a lot of recent advancements have been in protein detection, so looking at the abundance of different proteins, and developing so-called proteomic aging clocks. For example, a 2019 study developed a proteomic aging clock that demonstrated that individuals that had a lower predicted age than their chronological age performed better at cognitive and physical tests. And similarly looking still at proteins, but slightly different at the same time, a very recent publication has described so-called I-age, standing for inflammatory age, which is an immune profiling aging clock. So this time the proteins that they're identifying are proteins that are believed to be involved in the immune response and other inflammatory factors. Now, not only does it have a pretty good name for a clock, I age, (laughs) but they also showed in this study that it could be used to predict multimorbidity and frailty. And they go on from that to try and decipher which components that they're profiling could be a major contributor to this correlation. And they identify the protein CXCL9, suggesting that this protein is an important factor in age-related chronic inflammation. And so it goes back to the idea of if we can understand what these different clocks are measuring, 
It may help us to further understand the aging process itself and what factors might be critical to it, because that could also then give rise to different target sites. But it isn't necessarily guaranteed that the clocks themselves are causal molecular processes that underpin aging, and in fact it's currently thought that these different aging clocks may be reflecting different aspects of aging. And so this kind of leads on to the next section, which is what are the major challenges for the field at the moment? And that definitely includes being able to use these predictive clocks that have been developed and kind of deciphering them and working backwards to really see what is it they're actually identifying? What is it they're picking up? How does this relate to aging? But that isn't the only challenge that the aging clocks face at the moment. The second one is trying to identify the best sample source. And going back to what I was saying earlier about the noise in the data being both technical and biological, as for example, doing the test at different times of the day could give different readings, albeit that information in itself could be quite interesting to understand. And so that goes in line with how many measurements would be needed for a precise measurement. Would you have to take three and get an average or would one suffice? Also, are the clocks sex specific? While some have been demonstrated to be predictive for both males and females, I probably would be surprised if the efficacy of some of the clocks were not improved if sex-dependent differences were taken into account. And another interesting point to raise is the fact that I've mentioned how these different clocks may be reflecting different components of ageing, and so therefore certain tests may be more appropriate for different interventions, or maybe not appropriate in that case as well. And so I guess to try and explain what I mean, if we go back to the IH clock I mentioned, with CXTL9 being a major contributor, if I had somehow completely depleted it or knocked it out of my cells and then did this test, my age prediction would be very low after this intervention, yet it may not actually be a good thing to do, if that makes any sense. Basically, I think what I'm trying to say is you want to use a clock that's not biased towards a certain intervention. But doing that in an unbiased way, I also think would be quite challenging. Anyway, I also said in this video, we would talk about what clocks are currently available. And well, I actually came across a very good resource that I'm just going to refer you to because it's pretty much listed every clock that's currently available and gives some generic information to it. So you'll find a link to that in the description. So yeah, I got lucky on that one. So uh, with that, hopefully this has been a very good intro video to aging clocks. I know I haven't covered all of the different types of clocks available, but I do hope to do some follow-up videos if that is something of interest. So with that, I'd like to thank the sponsor for this week's video, Longevity Technology, for which I'm very grateful. Longevity Technology delivers high quality daily news and insights on research, investments and technologies that extend health span and lifespan. Find the link to their website in the description. So I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.